Hi, sorry for the delay. So, um, Brianna Hapinovich is going to be presenting today. She's an occupational therapist that graduated from the University of Philadelphia. Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia University, I'm sorry. And um, she works at the Tillman and 8th Avenue Neuro Rehab sites doing vision assessment and exercise prescription, and that's what she's going to be talking about today. Thank you. Now, can I, can I minimize this to oh. see the PowerPoint? That's okay. And then the notes around here. They should be. Notes. Okay. Notes should show up right there. And then just over key. Yep. Okay. I'm just going to make one edit here. There you go. All right. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Brianna. So I work at the Tillman and 8th Avenue, like Betsy said. Um, when Betsy came to me, asked me to do this presentation. Um, I just wanted to focus on some vision because I get a lot of vision questions across the board and asking to see what kind of screens we do, what kind of assessments we use, and then the treatments. Um, so I want to take this time to review a lot of the stuff that we do at both facilities. So again, I have no uh, financial relationships to disclose. Now, the objectives that I'm going to be reviewing are the uh, 13 components of the vision screen. So I'm going to break those down into each section and really go into the details of the screen and then also the impairments that you can look for. Um, I'm going to differentiate between exotropia and exophoria using visual screening tools, which a lot of questions arise from that. Um, I'm also going to talk about the treatment ideas for convergence insufficiency and other diagnoses identified during the vision screen. Okay, so for starting with some vision statistics, um, about 30% of stroke survivors experience some form of visual dysfunction. Um, those, the ones that typically get a lot of the visual deficits are those um, experiencing occipital lobe strokes, and that's about 70% 70 70 um, population do get those vision deficits. Now, the, I looked at a lot of systematic reviews to try to identify the statistics and things that can um, be more evidence-based. So I took a, a systematic review and dove into more of the TBI history for this one because there's so much um, contraindicating evidence with the TBI and the concussions. So I looked at the military system. So U.S. military members with TBI history in that are treated in the uh, military healthcare systems are usually diagnosed with a frequency of 7.3% for disorders of either accommodation, refractive errors, or other visual insufficiencies like convergence insufficiency. Um, now, when they took a different spin on it, they looked at the, those same veterans who were also treated in outpatient or inpatient facilities, so not necessarily in the military system, and they reported often over 50% of those uh, visual dysfunctions. And same thing, that's looking at the accommodation, refraction, and also convergence insufficiency. So that's, you can see where there's so much of a difference that lays in there. Now, how does vision impact functional performance? So this is where OTs really dive into it. So we look more on the functional side than just looking at, okay, this is the vision. Well, how can we improve it functionally? So vision includes how our brain makes sense of what we see. Um, so if there, say someone undergoes a stroke or undergoes a traumatic brain injury, concussion, that can disrupt the process of what the brain is making sense of when they visually see something. Um, vision allows us to gather, process, and react to our environment successfully. When the vision system is not working properly, these are the following tasks that can be affected. So we work with a lot of patients getting them back to being able to read successfully without any headaches, any kind of visual disturbances. Driving, now we get a lot of those who are unable to drive who are required to get a visual examination or a, uh, a go to the optometrist for evaluation in order to return to that driver role. Um, employment is also a high component that we focus on that also vision can affect school and recreational activities. Now, what kind of impacts does it have for each of those? So a lot of the times those will uh, report blurriness or double when they look at sustained uh, near point objects. So anything close, they'll get a lot of these symptoms. Um, it may increase headache symptoms, dizziness or nausea 
printed letter, letters or numbers. So when they try to focus on a page, a lot of them will report that it's moving or it's swimming. Um, it's not clear. That's going to be the ocelopsia, which is that diagnosis. Um, patient may re report aching, burning sensation, sensation, watering, or discomfort in both the eyes. Visual blurriness with transition from near to far. So for example, students in school, when they go from writing to a paper and then looking up and looking at the board or a PowerPoint slide or from going to the computer to the back to the table, they get a lot of that blurriness and that's what causes a lot of the symptoms as well. So they may report that it takes a little bit time to readjust when going from point to point. Um, visual blurriness or double vision with sustained near point tasks affecting the attention. So a lot of the times people will think it's an inattention problem when it's in reality, it's a lot of the vision components. So if they can't look at something because it's blurry or they can't sustain that attention, it looks like it affects their overall attention. So uh, the, the Mary Warren visual hierarchy model, this is a lot of the, the model that we use in our practice as occupational therapists. Um, so I'm going to go into detail which each uh, level rec uh, represents. So the first one's going to be the ocular motor control, visual fields, and visual acuity. Um, so this is the foundation for all the visual functions. So without these skills, we can't move on to the next ones, to the attention, the scanning. So this is one of the most important ones. Now, level two, going into the attention. Um, saccadic eye movements observed in scanning reflect the engagement of your overall visual attention as it's shifted from object to object. So they're saying if you have a deficit in this, it will then go into a deficit in the attention, which I just previously discussed. Uh, level three, you're looking at the pattern recognition. Um, sorry, the scanning. So eyes follow a specific route as they record visual information. So as we're scanning, all that information is being recorded in, in, uh, into the brain. So we're looking at that as an overall whole to help us not only navigate, read, and so forth. Uh, pattern recognition, that's identification of the significant features of an object in comparison to other objects. So are we able to identify the details like the shape, the color, the texture? Um, level five uh, is the ability to retain a picture of the image and then be able to recall it immediately or able to recall it with a little delay in between. So that's looking into the visual memory. Um, and then lastly, level six, the ability to manipulate visual information and integrate it with other sensory info involves into that visual cognition level. So can we make decisions? Can we gain knowledge? Can we formulate plans? That's all going to be in that. So it's it's a building block to that higher uh, level of the visual cognition. Okay, and this is what our vision screen looks like. So I'm sorry, the name got cut off on the top, but it goes the name, the diagnosis. Now, you always, like the next slide, I'll go through what the process is, but each step is going to focus on. So there's the 13 components. We're going to go through each one afterwards. Now, before we even begin it, you want to make sure you're gaining any kind of the visual history or the pre-existing visual impairment. So you want to look at, did they have any strabismus or astigmatism growing up? Did they have a lazy eye? You want to ask, did they have cataracts? Do they have, still do have cataracts? You want to look at all that, that visual abilities that could hinder their actual performance. Um, you want to inquire, do they wear glasses? Is it for reading? Is it for distance? So you can help guide when to wear those glasses, when to remove them. Do they have contacts? Um, you want to observe head posture. So when I'm, before I even begin, I'm going to look at how the, how the posture is and where the eyes are aligned. So some pa patients, without even doing a screen, they're going to have a head tilt for that to compensate for the lack of um, either the right eye or the left eye. After that, you're going to attend to what the eyes are doing throughout the full duration of the vision screen. So you, you never want to take your eyes off of what the eyes are doing. Now, the most important thing you want to look at is you want to first do all the tests monocularly, so looking at the eye solely by itself, and then you want to proceed into that binocular vision. And then that's going to ensure the most uh, accurate information. Now, diving into it. So visual acuity is the first thing I'm going to look at. Uh, visual acuity is the sharpness of vision measured by the ability to discern letters or numbers at a given distance. Now, we usually always, always start at either 12 to 14 inches away. So that's where they're going to hold their paper at. So you want to maintain that position as they try to read the numbers from left to right. So how do you access that? So you're going to ensure the person is wearing the prescribed glasses like stated above, and you're going to begin by covering the left eye. I always start with the left eye and assess the right eye. 
um, first. So the clinician is going to ask the patient to read the smallest row of numbers possible with the card held at approximately 12 to 14 inches away. And then you're going to perform again with the right eye cover. So you're looking at both eyes. You're going to perform until the bottom line is read or until the patient reads two incorrect numbers per line. Um, what the visual acuity should be, it should be 20 over 40 in both your eyes. Now, going back to driving, in order to drive in PA, your, eye, your vision should be at 20 over 40. Now, this is where a lot of people have a lot of difficulties with, the difference between cover-uncover and cross-cover tests. So first, we're going to look at the cover-uncover test. Um, this is used to determine if there is atropia, so, which is alignment that is always present. So the tropias always are going to be present. How do you access assess this. So the first eye is going to be covered for approximately one to two seconds. As one eye is covered, the uncovered eye is then observed. So you're not looking at the, the eye that you're covering, you're looking at the opposite eye. And you're going to look at if there is any shift in fixation. So there, you're going to have to maintain that shift, that fixation, and see what, if there is any kind of movement afterwards. The occluder is then removed, and any fixation movements are then noted under binocular conditions. You're going to repeat this for the opposite eye and do the same exact thing. Um, you're going to perform it for far points and then also near points. Now, findings. So the exotropia is when the eyes shift in or immediately when the opposite eye is occluded and then it back, bounces back out to that midline. Esotropia is when it first takes a jump outward and then rests inward. So it's, it's laterally shift. Hypertropia is if the unoccluded eye shifts downward when the opposite eye is occluded, and hypotropia is occluded when, if the included eye shifts up when the opposite eye is occluded. Um, so a lot of people get the exotropia and esotropia mixed up because they think exo out, but in reality, exotropia is when the eyes shift in. Now, moving to the cross cover test. So this is where you look at phorias. Uh, which is a misalignment that is only present when the binocular fusion is disrupted um, or suspended. So this test is performed in the same manner as what we just discussed, um, except the attention is turned to the eye that has been occluded for that short period of time. How do you assess? So you're going to cover one eye and then sh quickly shift to the other eye to break that binocular fusion. Um, you're going to perform it with, again, the far points and then also bounce to the near points. Finding same exact thing, exophoria is going to be deviation inward, esophoria is deviating outward, hypertropia is going to be deviating downward, hypophoria is going to be deviating upward. Um, so I included in the next slide an awesome YouTube video. We're not going to play that today just because it's a pretty long video that really dives into the details, but I wanted to include that so you guys could access, access it on your own time. But that's going to go over the difference between tropias and phorias and what it looks like. So the, the, they call it the monster eyes, I believe, that go over the eyes and then what it looks like for each of those uh, deviations. Um, so again, going over it again, tropia is the misalignment of the eyes that's always present. Phorias is the misalignment only when the binocular fusion is broken. Now, fixation, uh, which we've briefly discussed while talking about the tropias and the phorias, that's the ability to mean a visual hold on an object while stationary. So, again, when they're focusing on a near point object or even a far point object, can they sustain that focus when, with any kind of movement or deviation? Symptoms of a fixation dysfunction, they have inability to maintain focus on a target, disrupts sustained attention abilities. Um, looking away from a task often may, which may be interpreted as an inattention. So they look away just to get a break from that sustained hold. Loss of visual orientation and localization in space and disturbance of depth perception and distance. Moving on to the red green fusion light. So this is going to look at how both the eyes are working together and it helps us delineate which eye is the more the affected side. So first, you're going to have a patient don the, put on their red and green glasses. If they have prescribed glasses, you're going to put them on over top the glasses that they do wear. Uh, you're going to instruct the patient on the following process. So you're going to begin at about 12 to inches away from the patient, and you're going to slowly bring it into the bridge of their nose. The patient's goal to notify the clinician when the target splits into two. So the point that they want to split into the two, they're going to notify. Um, the typical range, so that with the normal range that they should be able to identify is two inches. You're going to repeat that same assessment, but with a pen light. 
Now, the goal of the patient is to notify the staff when they notice the red and green lights in a circle, but splitting half and half. Now, if someone comes to me and says during the assessment that they only see their red light, they see the red light, the red light, well, then I know the left eye is more affected because they can't, they're not focusing on, through that eye at all because they're all, they're compensating with that right eye so much. So it helps delineate between the two eyes. The findings, so diplopia with no fusion, so the double vision without it's no, there's no double vision across the board. That means there's a huge misalignment happening. Um, ability to assess, this test looks at binocular vision and also possible binocular visual dysfunctions. And it's also able to identify, like I said, which, is, which eye is not teaming accurately. Near point convergence. So the ability of the eyes to simultaneously turn inward to focus on a near point target. Um, Similar to the red and green fusion light uh, with a finger, you're going to start about approximately 12 inches away, and you're going to move it to the bridge of the patient's nose. You're going to assess how the eyes are moving inward together and sustaining that convergence ability. So you're not only going to move it and stop, you're going to sustain, I usually hold it to see if they can sustain it. A lot of times that's where you're going to notice a break because they have an intolerance in the convergence, not necessarily just decrease in teaming. So you're looking at, is there decreased te teaming in any or both of the eyes? Are the eyes moving past midline simultaneously? There will be patients who there's no convergence past midline at all, so they're not even beginning to get that trace movement to the convergence endpoint. Um, functional limitations of convergence insufficiency are losing place when reading or writing, uh, difficulties performing tasks close up, complaints of blurred vision, double vision, or focusing on near point targets. Um, sometimes we get the reports of the os oscillopsy, which is the page or the, the letters are swimming or moving, um, eye strain fatigue, headaches provoked by near point tasks. Now the Brock string. So this assesses the binocular vision and possible binocular vision dysfunctions. Again, this test is also a key component of looking at how the eyes are teaming together appropriately. Um, so it's a white string with three movable colored beads on it. The first bead is approximately four inches from the nose. The second bead is then eight inches from the nose. And the third bead is from 12. So it's four inches between all three of the beads. How do you access? So you're going to have the patient look at the near fixation bead. So usually it's the one four inches away. You're going to ask that how many, the patient how many strings they see as they stick, stay fixated on that first colored bead. If they see the string splitting into two, ask the patient then where the strings are, are crossing, because that's going to look at how they are processing the visual information in front. So alignment, so they, what's the, with the normal limit range is they should be seeing an X, so two going into that first bead and two coming out. So that's telling me that they can see both the near point and focus on near point and also far point. Misalignment is if they just see one string following, they don't see any of the strings and they're just parallel from one to the other. Um, that means the eyes are misaligned and they're not teaming at all. Uh, suppression of near vision is when they're crossing at the first color bead and then, sorry, near point is when they see one string and then it splits. So they're suppressing that near vision and can't get both the eyes to team together to get that near point vision. So it forms a Y. Uh, suppression of far vision, so strings crossing before the first colored bead and then goes into the, the, the one string. So that's it's a backwards Y. So they can team the eyes to see the strings near point, but then the suppression happens far away. Going into ocular motility, so this first we're going to talk about pursuits. Um, so the ability to follow moving objects smoothly and accurately with one eye at a time or both eyes together. How to assess this, you're going to move target in each manner to cover all visual planes. Um, and you're going to look at the, the ability to move it in a smooth manner. You're also going to assess, are their eyes slightly jerky or super jerky with any kind of loss of attention to the, that moving target? Uh, symptoms of pursuit dysfunction, loss of target when you're moving it, decreased visual attention span, difficulties crossing midline with the eyes, and difficulties with driving and engaging in sports. So this is a lot of times where we'll see a lot of decrease in hand-eye coordination, uh, visual motor integration. So these are pursuits is what's going to affect those skills.
Now, saccades, the ability to adjust fixations from one stationary object to the other, how to assess this. You're going to hold two targets in a horizontal plane, ask the patient to jump from one target to the next. You're going to also repeat that in vertical. I also do diagonal as well. Uh, you're going to assess the visual movements for one, promptness, accuracy, and then dysmetria. So dysmetria is, are they overshooting or are they undershooting? A lot of times you'll see a break in between, and that's going to be their undershooting just to one, get themselves to the next target. So they can't tolerate going from one to the next successfully. Symptoms of sagades dysfunction are decreased reading speed and comfort, eyes fatigue easily when reading, um, poor attention, losing space or skipping lines when reading, or difficulty locating objects quickly. So it's going to take the person a little bit longer to identify those objects. Now, ocular mobility, the range of motion, are they able to move their eyes in all visual fields? So a lot of times we're going to see this post-stroke um, where the, there are some structural uh, dysfunctions going on and they just can't move their pass either to the right side, the left side, or even past midline. Um, so if you're, if you're noticing during your pursuit test or your saccades that they can't get from in the horizontal planes or in the vertical planes, you know there is, there is a disruption being disrupting that ability. Um, so the other key aspect of it, so say I feel like I, I see someone, they can't identify anything in their peripheral or say there's there's uh, a diagnosis of homonymous hemianopsia or a field cut, I'm going to jump right into visual perceptual midline test. Now, I don't do this for everyone. It's more of those occasions if it's being recorded that they cannot, uh, they have loss of vision on one side. So how we're going to do this is I usually pull a clinician to help me with this. I'm going to have that clinician sit right directly in front of the patient that's being assessed, and I'm going to inform them to stare at the clinician's nose. Um, their goal is to not move their eyes and stay focused on the nose while I bring objects from either right or left peripheral visual fields and ask them to tell me or notify me when they identify the object. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Now, the visual perceptual midline test is also going to, sorry, I went over the last test. So visual perceptual midline test, then I'm going to also have them start at the right visual fields have them tell me when it gets right in front of the person's nose. I'm going to also then have them start at the top portion and tell me when it gets right in front of their eyes. We're going to also look at to see if there's any shift in midline or shift in horizon. Now, if there's a shift, a lot of times you'll see that's when the person has a head tilt to accommodate. This is what I was talking about, so I'm sorry. So the perceptual screening, the two-person confrontation test, that's going to be when I'm going to have that clinician sit directly in front of the patient. Um, and that's going to look solely on that visual perceptual identification and what degree can they identify objects successfully. Um, this is a, another huge current uh, concern. If someone st is still driving with a field cut, are they able to identify objects moving in either side? When they walk, um, in a store, are they able to navigate successfully? Um, and this also helps identify those um, who have the field cuts in the homonymous hemianopsia. Now, visual perceptual skills, little willow. <laughs> um, so this kind of hits home for me a lot, um, just giving a backstory. So my daughter um, was diagnosed with a very high uh, stigmatism, so she's minus 10. Um, and this, this is... I could understand what happens here is because uh, because she wasn't seeing anything near point, so she has severe myopia, uh, so she's nearsighted. She was unable to pick out objects from any kind of uh, visual cluttered area. So say um, she knew her letters, but if I put a bunch of cubes out, she was n never able to identify the letter at that point because all the visual clutter, she was unable to bring that from the very beginning. Um, so. This goes into a little bit of that. So visual perceptual and motor skills, um, which are the ability to see, perceive, and interpret the visual information around us. So I'm going to go into detail of each one of those. So visual description, dis discrimination allows one to see differences between objects that are similar. Um, so can they identify an object that is slightly different but also similar at the same time? Visual figure ground, again, what I was talking about, Willow had a lot of difficulties with, was discerning an object from the background or when there's a lot of clutter around it. Visual closure is ability to fill in the gaps. So if a uh, missing piece 
of information is taken away from a picture, can they still fill in that piece to identify the object? Um, visual form constancy is the ability to mentally manipulate an option into different positions while still being able to identify that object. Visual motor integration is what we know of as our eye-hand coordination or eye-body coordination. Visual memory, which we discussed before, is the ability to remember um, for immediate recall and also later on. Now, visual, visual spatial relations is the ability to perceive relations in, relationships in objects, position, or space. So your laterality, your directionality um, falls into that category. Now, a lot of people ask, okay, you you get that information, you know that information, well, what are the treatment ideas that we can use to help address and improve um, each one of those skills? Um, so for convergence insufficiencies, I included a bunch that we use very often. Uh, the first one is gonna be the Mary Warren embedded word search. So you always get the person to sustain attention near point, um, and they're gonna have that focus ability while all that visual clutter is there. So you're going to have them scan left to right. Sustain any kind of, for this, any kind of sustain your point task with visual clutter is going to help improve that convergence now, not only um, the actual skill, but also the tolerance. So if they have a lot of intolerance, they get, they're getting headaches, they're getting blurriness, you want to hone in on this and try to improve that tolerance so we can increase the challenge each time they come. Um, so the next thing that's very high, like I was talking about, monocular vision is very important for any kind of these skills. So you want to do, a lot of times we'll do sustain your point task with the taping strategy. So we do monocular vision first. So we're going to include the right eye, the left eye then, um, and you're going to increase the time of the occlusion each time, depending on what symptoms they get or what, what response they have towards the monocular taping. Then you're going to go into occluding the bilateral peripheral visual field to facilitate that convergence. So instead of the al allowing the eyes to drift out, it forces the eyes to drift in. Um, and then you're going to end with binocular vision. So no matter what, if I do a monocular vision, I'm always going to end with that binocular vision because that's the end goal I want them to improve on is teaming the eyes together and getting that binocular vision um, success. Find the bug worksheet with patient place and supine, so laying down, getting the worksheet right in front of them to get that near point task. Um, also, a word search with visual clutter will be is something that we can improve the challenge on too. Now, accommodated dysfunction or assist case dysfunction, <clears throat> you always, with this, I start, and I do this a lot, you're going to transfer from one stationary object to the next. So you always want to address the near-far saccadic movements. So this can be in the horizontal plane, and it also can be in the vertical plane, so going from one point to the next. Um, a lot of times, OTs are going to simulate even either their school demands, so going from computer to the table or their working demands. Um, so we try to simulate that also with what their demands are, whether it's school, work, um, or driving in that case as well. So tracking tube alternating from board to floor to tube. So we have a tracking tube that has letters um, left to right or numbers. And we usually do this with a scanning board. So we have them identify the letter on the board with all the visual clutter and then also find that stop the ball that rolls left to right or right to left at that letter. Um, so it really, really focuses on that saccadic movement. Uh, Mary Warren scanning sheets are also good. So a lot of these can tie into various different skills. Uh, word search and near point reading tasks. So you, this is, the saccades are going to really look at that, the reading. Um, pursuit dysfunction. So what we look at is visual tracking activities. Um, ball push with cones. So a lot of times we'll do uh, a ball push and have the eyes track the ball le either up and down or left to right, really getting that um, pursuit ability. Flashlight tag is a good one. Um, it's great for the pediatric population as well. So putting them in a dark room and having them follow the flashlight uh, light on the wall with their eyes. Hand-eye coordination activity. So any kind of hand-eye coordination is going to be a great way to address this dysfunction as well. Now, taking a step out of that and going into more of the visual field deficit that we a lot of times see from post-stroke, um, a visual field deficit may occur due to either the damage of the eye, to the optic nerve, or to the brain. When the area of the visual field is missing is when we usually see the visual 
defects. So a lot of the times people can't really explain what they're seeing. So all they can say is either that they're missing a portion of the vision or it's completely blurry on that side. Um, I wanted to go over the different kind of visual field deficits or the heminopsias as well. So the, the first picture is going to go over what a central scotoma is. So it's a lot of pe times people will say, I have floaters all over the vision. The central scotoma is when it's going to be directly in your central portion of your vision. Quadrant, quadrant um, nopsia is going to be one in a specific quadrant um, is where you're going to get your deficits. A lot of times this is going to be with the homonymous heminopsias, but just a specific quadrant. Um, so the second picture is going to look at, in this case, that the top right portion of that person's eyes was the affected. And then homonymous heminopsia is what you're going to see out of that left, that far right picture, where both sides of the person's eyes are occluded. <clears throat> So how does this functionally um, affect those with the visual field deficits? They have poor spatial awareness, so navigating in a crowded environment. A lot of times a patient will report people bumping into, um, well, them bumping into someone or knocking over um, things on the shelves in the store because they can't successfully navigate in those areas. Misreading words, reading slowly, a lot of times they're going to skip lines and not be able to identify that these skip lines. Um, difficulties identifying items in the affected visual field. So a lot of times people think putting all of the all the things that they need on that affected side will be helpful, whereas first we want to retrain it to get them to be able to, to look on that side. So you want to put it on the opposite side. Um, difficulties with driving is also a huge indicator for a visual field deficit. Um, a lot of times, like I said before, if they do have this diagnosis, they are most likely going to have to have a full in-depth optometry or neurooptometry eval to regain their license. Uh, behavior changes and field deficits. So the individual will usually adapt a narrow search pattern, so they're going to favor the side that is the affected side. Um, they're also going to have an in inattention to that affected side, so a lot of the OTs are going to have to hone in on taking a step out and looking at that left side and reminding them that they have to turn their head to look instead of just gazing over to that side. Um, they may miss or misidentify the visual detail on that affected side, change in handwriting, and also change in overall orientation. Now the treatments for the visual field deficits. So you, it's you want to help, like I said, hone in onto that affected side first. So if we can get them to be a little bit more knowledgeable, to turn their head to that side, that's what our first um, approach is going to be, more the rehabilitation side. If we notice that a lot of times this will be something that's permanent, um, we can then go into the more the compensatory adaptive strategies to help then, you know, modify their environment so they can successfully manage a little bit more and, and improve the safety. Um, obstacle courses to improve safe navigation, uh, visual training and stack tracking in all visual fields, um, and also teaching, like I said, compensatory adaptive and also adapting the environment to meet the patient's needs. Now, going in, so as we all know, vision is a, is a very tricky um, I get, overall topic to research on because there's such conflicting evidence. Some some evidence can tell you one thing, and then another another um, article can say no, that's incorrect, and then it's all over the place. So I wanted to focus more on how what treatments are out there that help support accommodation and also convergence, which a lot of times you will see in our clinic. Um, so I want to look at more of the articles that focus on those instead of just saying, okay, 70% of those experiencing this are going to experience this. I want to go more of the treatment. So the first evidence, I just put up the results. I'm going to go over the information now. Um, the first article I chose was a um, control cross cover uh, article. And it's the main, the main point that they wanted to go over with was to determine if monocular accommodative training, which a lot of times we will do at our office, could be used to increase accommodative amplitudes and also reduce the visual blurriness, which is the asthenopia. Um, and the, all this is going to look at those who were diagnosed by um, clinicians with accommodative infacility or accommodative deficiencies. 
Now the methods, there was two male and then three female. So again, people looked at this as not a lot of um, people in the study, but I will discuss why it was hard to get more of the p patients in the studies. Uh, their age was 27 years old, uh, 25 to 30 years were the, the range. The diagnosis, again, like I said, was an accommodative anomaly with uh, visual blurriness. Um, the criteria for inclusion, so all patients had to have symptoms usually associated with accommodative um, deficiencies such as blurred vision um, and or decreased reading performance. So they're looking more on their reading. So a lot of the patients had difficulties or increased time required to, to read line to line. Um, a full binocular evaluation was first performed and measurements were taken. The following measurements were distance and near foria, uh, distance and near base in and out ranges, accommodative amplitude and monocular estimate method of, is, was there any kind of lag with accommodation? Um, then each patient completed a three item questionnaire designed to rate the severity of the visual blurriness and each item was scored on a one to five basis. So they also did a subtractive on top of the objective measures as well. Um, after the evaluation, the five patients were then divided into two groups um, that were matched appropriately with the severity of their symptoms. Uh, three were randomly assigned to the experimental group and then two the control group. Now, going into the experiment group measurements, what they did was they had the plus lenses placed in front of the right eye um, and then the minus lens placed in the left eye, which was then switched. Um, and they did alternating mon monocular accommodative training. So a lot of things like we were saying, going near and far. Um, after five minutes, they were then switched. And if the patient was able to maintain clarity for five minutes with the plus and minus lenses without any signs of any kind of ocular fatigue, the power of the next pair was then increased. The control group now, so they did the same exact testing, but instead of using the plus minus lenses, they use plano lenses, which are, there's no, there's no prescription in the lens. So the, the clinician and also the patient had no idea if, you know, that it was just plano lenses. Um, another binocular evaluation was performed. Um, and then the experimental group and the control group switched. So there was an additional six weeks for the training for the experimental group um, that had the same exact identical uh, training with the plano lenses like the control. And then the control group had received another 12 weeks of training with conditions that were identical to the experimental. So that's when they used the plus minus lenses while doing the accommodative training. Um, there was a third then clinical testing with that um, the questionnaire. So the results. So the patients who received experimental training during the phase one showed a marked increase in accommodation amplitude compared to those of the control group. So they found that going right to the plus minus lenses and did the training was most successful than doing the plano lenses without that deviation and then doing the experimental was, was not as, as uh, successful as that experimental group. Um, a, so then they used the assigned for a sign test for ranked data, which revealed a statistically significant difference between the effects of experimental and control conditions with regard to that visual blurriness. So they're saying a lot of times their their blurriness is going to reduce, which will then improve that accommodative skill. Um, then after phase two, again, a substantial change in performance could be seen for control groups. So it did increase after they did the experimental conditions, but not nearly as much as the experimental group where they went right into the plus minus lenses. Um, all but one patient showed an increase in the accommodative amplitude after exposure to the experimental conditions. Um, and they also didn't get a relief in a lot of the visual blurriness symptoms that they were having. The mean change of the accommodative amplitude was significantly larger, again, with the experimental and control conditions. Now, again, well, what is the discussion with this? So studies show that monocular accommodative training results in improvement in accommodative amplitude and also the facility going near and far without any kind of that lag or blurriness. Um, it also, four of the five patients also experienced significant relief of symptoms um, during that questionnaire. So a lot of their symptoms reduced, which then enhanced that accommodative ability. 
Now, the major changes in performance with this accommodative training was the reduction in blurred vision during reading and increase in reading time. So they were able to read a lot quicker than those without this training or prior to the training. Um, and also reduction in overall ocular fatigue with any kind of those movements. Um, so the, the finding supports the notion that improvement in commutative amplitude and facility is related functionally to that symptom reduction, like I was stating before. Now, limitations. So with a lot of the articles that I reviewed, it was very, the, the limitations were that they couldn't find as many in this because a lot of times with the accommodative dysfunctions are, there's a convergence insufficiency as well. So they wanted to tease out all of those with the, the underlying convergence insufficiency as well and just focus on the accommodative. Um, so it was hard to find those just solely with that accommodative convergence um, dysfunction. So this study did not find any improvement with the depth perception or, again, divergence after accommodative therapy. So it didn't address the others. It just addressed solely that accommodative ability. Now, switching gears here, I focused on now convergence, which is another um, treatment we really focus on at our clinic. Um, and again, tricky evidence was also that some they had to keep it at a at a lower seven patient ratio um, just because getting that that inclusion criteria was was tough um, so for this article the primary purpose of the study was to determine the effect of fusional emergence training under controlled conditions and also to reduce that visual blurriness that a lot of those with convergence insufficiency uh, report uh, this study, the methods were three male and four female. Um, one person dropped out before completion of the study. Uh, diagnosis of convergence is in insufficiency with accompany, uh, accompanying visual blurriness was made independently by two clinicians. Um, now, for the criteria inclusion, so the patient had to meet two of the three inclusion criteria, which was near point convergence greater than 7.5 centimeters with a recovery rate than 12.5 centimeters. Um, and then near base out fusional ranges less than twice the demand and base out ranges at near or equal to or less than two standard deviations below the population mean. Um, and again, for the study, it, those had to be 20 over 20 for the visual acuity. Um, all patients before the, the study started had to have a uh, initial optom uh, optometry evaluation. Uh, they measured the refractive state, the distance in your euphoria, uh, cover test, uncover test, base out and base in. Um, they also used prism lenses um, to get more of information. Uh, they also looked at the accommodation and near point convergence um, in inches or centimeters. They also did a seven item questionnaire like the last test that was scored on a one to five basis. Um, and that was going over more of the visual blurriness and the symptoms that they had present. Now, what the what they, what they did for the first initial testing was they they took a large screen screen and where they could see a dot pattern with a central inner square either popping out or the, the inner square, the inner circle could be at a stagnant place, so it didn't always have to be shown that it was popping out. Um, the stimuli remained in view until a patient either responded or occurred for a maximum of 10 seconds. Correct responses made to their presence of the, the inner square led to an increase in the convergence. So if they were able to identify it, they kept bumping up the convergence demands. Um, so if they did, it was by 0.66 base out um, on each of the next trials that they were identifying each one of those successfully. The incorrect responses then um, led to a decrease in the convergence demands by 1.32. Um, patients were then, after that testing matched like the other tests in two groups based on the severity of the visual blurriness and also the convergence abilities. Um, each member was then assigned to either an experimental group or the control group. Patients in the ex experimental group initially received Virgin's training procedure identical to the, the testing that I just described prior to the testing began. They did 100 trials per weekly in session and they did about 15 second, uh, sessions. Patients in the control condition received the same number, but what was different is the convergence demands remained constant. So there was never an increase or a decrease in that convergence demand. 
Um, after the second phase, the baseline testing was again performed and traditional um, orthotic therapy was initiated. So they did um, an extra minimum of eight sessions, one per week of the orthotics, and then also did the, the end evaluation to see what the changes were. <clears throat> so going over the results, after experimental phase, um, all patients exhibited significant increases in maximum virgins as compared to that recorded in the preceding baseline or control phase. So they, the mean increase in the virgins for all seven page, uh, patients was 17.7. Now, a much smaller virgins was measured at 2.4 for those who underwent that control phase. Um, now, after orthotic therapy that they did in addition to that testing after, um, for the five patients, the retesting of the virgins radius was complete, um, and they found a moderate but not very but variable improvement in the brace breakout breakout point in comparison to what they found at the end of the experimental phase. So the mean improvement was approximately 7.30 for that. Now, a Freeman two-way analysis of variance revealed a statistically significant difference in reported symptoms between these conditions. So again, with this kind of training, a lot of those re reported a significant decrease in either the blurriness, the discomfort um, that they noticed when they first prior to doing to this evaluation. So the final score of the um, questionnaire was the mean of 30.5, which was close to the upper limit, uh, 35, which represents a total asymptomatic patient. So you could see that huge jump. Um, now, what does this say? So the, the reduced ability to transfer virgin skills learned in one task to another for the convergence insufficiency population may explain why the visual blurriness in many patients with the uh, convergence insufficiency is not relieved by just doing pencil push-ups. So the, the, the key of this is that they feel as though doing multiple convergence insufficiency training, so implementing different stimuli, so not just doing pencil push-ups with that same, same skill. They want you to deviate and do different um, convergence training to be able to carry over to the one, the school environment, the clinic, or um, working environments. Um, so they want to make sure that you're doing a vast variety of skills um, in order to, to transfer from environment to environment. Um, the changes in convergence performance were much smaller after the control phase in which there was no change in convergence demand. So you could tell that even though they, they didn't know the Plano, they didn't describe any changes. Um, so a lot of people, there's some studies that a lot of this can be um, psychogenic or psychosomatic and that they're just reporting this. Well, because the, the patients didn't know the lack of changes in the symptoms at the, the control phase strongly suggests that the symptoms were due to sh strictly a uh, virgin um, dysfunction and not just that psychosomatic factor. <clears throat> now, a significant reduction in visual blurriness also was evident. Um, for the convergence insufficiency population. They also feel like that traditional orthoptic therapy on top of the convergence training resulted in the greatest improvements for the fusional convergence ranges and the greatest reduction in that visual blurriness. So this suggests the need for a multi-method approach to fusional virgins training in order to maximize tr or transfer to the patient's normal working or school environments. <clears throat> Any questions? <laughs> Okay. How long did it take them to get back to like full virgins? So they say the typical, the their typical training outside the sample is usually between two to three months. Okay. Yep. And then under those same conditions. Okay. And do you find like you see that? Absolutely. So this the the key point of this is so a lot of people say research research, which is a great tool, but with clinical clinical experience, we see so many improvements with what we do in the clinic, um, and, and that's for concussions, that's for stroke. Um, so we do clinically see a lot of improvement. Again, with I completely agree with more of the blurriness blurriness, easier read, um, not going jumping line to line when they're trying to go or hold their spot. Um, so that was also suggested into that research article too. But they said about two to three months that they worked with those patients outside the sample. And then do you typically refer out to them? Nice, good question, <laughs> Kristen. So what we've been, so 
Yeah, so I had a big conversation with Dr. Diem, who, for those of you who don't know, um, the, oh wait, Krista said, can Bree repeat the questions in the microphone? The oh, okay. So the first question was, what did you ask? Oh, how long did it take for them to get back to their um, norms? Um, in the study after the sample, they did, they say usually it takes about two to three months for them to return to that baseline um, and for them to keep reporting less and less visual blurriness. Now, the second question that uh, Kristen asked was, when do you refer out to neurotometry? Um, just recently, I had a long conversation with Dr. Diem, who is the person that I um, refer to a lot of my patients. Um, and he says, as soon as possible is better. But the, the key point that I usually use, and he was also a section of this, is I keep them for at least four weeks, um, see how they respond to our therapy, see if there's any kind of improvement. At the reeval, which we perform every, every four weeks, if I don't notice any kind of improvement or there's a slight improvement, I'm going to refer them right to neurooptometry to make sure I'm not missing anything that they can identify with that really in-detail visual uh, evaluation. What is the difference in the exercises that they do at vision therapy versus what you're doing? So Betsy asked, what's the difference between the exercises at vision therapy to the, what we do? So vision therapy is going to be a lot more technology. So they, they use a, so I'm going off of what I know, Dr. Diem. They use the right eye program, which is a computerized uh, technological system that measures the um, circadian movements pursuits. So there's there's a lot more objective measures for each one of those processes. So it's all going to be on computer, um, and a lot of times it's going to be the real exercise like pencil push-ups performed at home. OT is going to focus more on that functional. So how can we get back? get the person back to doing what they need to do. So school, being able to read or um, tolerate the screen time more than one hour without any kind of symptoms. Um, for those with stroke, getting them to be able to navigate safely, um, get them back to driving if, if they are able to. So we'd take more of a functional standpoint in trying to get them back to those rules that are meaningful to them. Any other questions? <laughs> I don't think so. I hope you could hear the question. All right. Thank you, everybody.